God. I have to say, it's really great to be here. I've, uh, you know, I went to a lot of classes at Williams, and they were great classes, but they never asked me to be up in front before. <laughs> so it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, so the topic is ideas. But before we get to ideas, I just want to say a little bit about me and how I got to be mayor, uh, a little bit about Seattle and the challenges we face. Um, and that then takes us to the ideas we're trying to employ at the city to deal with those challenges. Graduated from Williams in 82. Found myself down in D.C. Uh, about a year after college, working for a congressman. Liked politics, but wanted to get away from D.C. Ended up out in Oregon and then Seattle going to law school. And I was a lawyer in private practice and really active in my community and uh, my neighborhood and for the Sierra Club, too. One thing led to another, and uh, I got deep, more deeply involved in civic life, started a little nonprofit, and then ran for mayor. Wasn't really planning on it, never held elected office before, but that happened about two and a half years ago. And I'm a really fortunate guy, because I'm the mayor of an absolutely spectacular city, the city of Seattle. And it's a city that has really fabulous uh, assets and advantages. You know, you know we're the home of software companies like Microsoft, their new Amazon uh, headquarters downtown where they want to expand. Microsoft Store is opening up downtown, and Microsoft is ex tremendously excited about that, as you'll see. <laughs> um, Maritime shipbuilding and repair. You know the whole uh, deadliest catch? Well, the Crab f Fleet is located in Seattle. That's where they're headquartered, and we build ships there, repair ships there. We have a manufacturing base um, with Boeing and other manufacturers. We have research institutions like the University of Washington, the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center, biotech companies, philanthropy. The Gates Foundation is now downtown working on global health issues, and there are other related global health companies. Innovative retailers, Nordstrom, Starbucks, REI, Amazon as well, uh, that have become national brands. And we have a diverse population. Almost 18% of the city of Seattle is foreign, foreign born, 40% um, born outside the state. People come from all over the country and the world to come to Seattle, which is fabulous. We have great arts and culture. You may be familiar with Hendrix and Nirvana, um, <laughs> but it's more than that. You know, it's theater and and, and film, interesting neighborhoods with locally owned businesses. Some of them grow into big businesses, some just remain small businesses. And some reasonably well-preserved historic neighborhoods. We're not like you know, older East Coast cities, but we have some older neighborhoods, we preserved them, and they're walkable uh, places that people like as well. In fact, we're now at the age when people really want to live in cities. The aging baby boomers, the younger generation are moving back to the cities. You know, the post-World War II era saw cities empty out. Now it's reversed. By the way, that has some consequences, because when the cities emptied out, many minority populations were left behind by intentional policies of redlining. And now those neighborhoods are highly desirable again, and gentrification's occurring. So that's one of the challenges we face. And so now I'll turn to challenges, because like any big city, we have big challenges. There's a portion of the population that's homeless, whether it's economically related or because we can't reach them. Um, to help them deal with mental health or substance abuse issues. Unemployment is going down, but it remains stubbornly high for, Af for young African-American men or Latinos or immigrant and refugee populations. These handsome young men, a soccer team coming to visit me in my office, they're going to have a harder time finding a job than other young men and women in the city will. Uh, race still matters. Our local public school system is a mixed quality. We've got great schools, but particularly in our minority neighborhoods, um, these are schools that are struggling, and you'll notice the, the colors other than uh, uh, the different colors reflect Latino, African American, and Asian populations in the city of Seattle. Public health outcomes are declining. Obesity, diabetes, and related uh, issues, uh, lifestyle issues, uh, is on the rise, and we have the same issues uh, in Seattle. We also have aging infrastructure. We're not that old a city, but we're old enough that our sewers, roads, uh, electrical lines need upgrading, and we have to find the money to pay for it. And we didn't necessarily take care of our natural assets the way we should. So the Duwamish River, which flows into our port, is a Superfund site, and we're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to, to clean it up. And that's infrastructure, too. And we've had the longest, deepest economic recession since the Great Depression. And I think everybody feels that it's not going to be just another boom that followed the last bust. This one is a long, slow recovery. And it reflects the fact that maybe we don't have all the resources that we had before. You know, I think a lot of our expansion was fueled by cheap fuel prices. And I don't think it's coming back. We can see those fuel prices keep going up. So how do we 
deal with these challenges, particularly when we even have another serious problem. Mistrust in government is at an all-time high. They've tracked it, and it manifests itself um, in things like the Occupy movement or the Tea Party movement. And it's fascinating. We got more Occupy in Seattle than, than Tea Party, but polling last fall showed that a majority of Americans identified with either one. When I worked for the congressman, he had a line. He said, uh, government's like a shoe. You don't notice it until it doesn't fit. And for a lot of people, government doesn't fit anymore. You know, it rankles. And so what unifies Occupy and the Tea Party is a deep mistrust of government. And you know, you really can't blame them for thinking so. What did we just talk about? Homelessness, aging infrastructure, widening income inequality, which is a fact of life. So what have our leaders been doing is the question. So they are very mistrustful and they want, they want better answers from government. I referenced Occupy in the speech and I could tell you a lot of stories. We had to deal with Occupy in Seattle um, as well as everyone else in major cities. But I, I mention it mainly because it, it sets the context. So what are the set of ideas uh, that you can deal with this? Now cities can't do everything by themselves. You know, there are big federal and state policies. Um, but we really address people at a very local level and on fundamental issues, and we do have resources. There's also world economic issues, and we can't necessarily solve all of those. So we just have to start looking at the things we can do that, if we're lucky, can hit multiple things at once. You know, some people call it triple bottom line. They'll probably add a fourth bottom line to this one soon. And that's what we're trying to do here. So first thing I would say we have to do is government must be open to the public. So we've got dataseattle.gov. We put all our data sets up in a readable format so people can pull it down. We've tossed much more of our information up online. We have our traffic cameras, crime maps, um, a pothole map. You can call in a pothole or you can type in a pothole and this will keep track real time how long it takes for it to get repaired. So you can keep track of the pothole you turned in. Um, and it matters. Potholes matter. So we also put online performance expectations for each of our departments. I sit down with my department heads and we review um, what their goals are. Quantifiable in some take cases, qualitative in others. We post them and track quarterly so people can see what we've said we're going to do and then how are we doing with it. We also use uh, Twitter and Facebook extensively. You have to go where people are. And we were recently rated uh, the number one uh, government for using social media, which was fun because it's changing the culture of government because everyone in government is trying to be more interactive. I talked about a lot of online things, but you have to do it in person too. So I'm out every week um, in town halls in different neighborhoods. We bring out our department heads, we bring out uh, department folks, and we just try to connect people because we want to be responsive. Another thing we do to try to demonstrate responsiveness is we have matching fund programs. This is an old idea for Seattle, um, but a new idea for other places. We put together a pot of money, and if you can match it with dollars or volunteer hours or volunteer resources, um, you can get the grant. And so in that way, we can leverage communities to do things like playgrounds or, or other local improvements. You want to be open, you want to be effective, but now we'll even go higher. What is it going to take for cities like ours to compete in the world economy? We're going to have to be innovative. We have to support innovation and innovative ideas. And that can be a little tough for government. We can innovate within government, but we tend to be slower than the rest of the world. But we can set the context in which innovators, whether they're academics, entrepreneurs, engineers, artists, can flourish. We can do that as regulators, making it easier for Amazon to build their headquarters downtown, rather than make it hard so that they can, you know, maybe build in a green field out in the suburbs. And we want to make it easy for them. We want to make it easier for the biotech companies or the UW to expand. We want to fund the arts, and we do, because they're innovators. Um, but the next thing you want to do is, if you're going to make it easier for people to innovate, is you want to make them connect with each other. And we get this at a college campus, right? All the different disciplines and people interact, and new ideas come out of the interaction, ideas that you didn't even know where they'd come from. I guess that's why they call them new. So how do you do that in a city? And that's what cities naturally do. So we have to enhance the connectivity between our residents, between our academics, entrepreneurs, artists, and the like. Um, and you do that a bunch of different ways. One is the type of place we build. Well, I want to think of, just give you this thought for a second. Remember when you were 16, I guess maybe if you're older, you had to get your driver's license immediately. 
because that's how you connected with people. How are you going to meet your friends? In fact, American Graffiti is there connecting all night long, right? Now, if you want to connect, everybody reaches for their phone when they're 13 or 14, and they text. So people now connect electronically, um, but they still want face-to-face -face interaction, and that's why we see the popularity of great neighborhoods. So walkable, mixed-use communities with transit are the other ways we can get people to connect with each other. And we're going to invest in that as well. So that means arts, nightlife, cultural diversity, coffee shops, bike lanes, you know, these are all, uh, you know, I tend to think coffee shops are an indicator species of, you know, innovation and creativity <laughs> in a place, right? It's literally where people meet. So we want to support those things. But the next question is, if you create prosperity for some, how do you widen the circle of prosperity so more people get to share in it? And that's really critical. So that's education. We have a families and education level. We don't run the schools district, but we collect property taxes, give grants to schools and for after school activities, and ask them to track outcomes for the kids being served to see if they're doing better in school. Now that's for kids. We have something we want to do for our grown-ups who are struggling. You know, people that didn't get the foundation or came from another country. We have something called Pathways to Careers. We've gone out to our growth industries and we've asked them to identify um, the needs they have. And we're partnering with the community college system and our job training money to find ways to give people little chunks of credit and training at a time, sometimes where they are. Because if you're struggling, you can't necessarily take a year or two off to go to school. So if you can get 15 credits at a time and stack credentials. We've worked on uh, minority contracting. We now have set a higher standard. Nobody's allowed to use quotas, but we can set a higher standard for how hard do you work to connect with people before you bid on the project. And as a result, we've seen minority contracting increase dramatically in the city. Our next one is local hire requirements. We've done this with a program called Community Power Works, in which we are using federal stimulus money to retrofit uh, buildings, commercial, industrial, homes. Um, the contractors, communities of color, labor, funders came together and came up with a community workforce agreement. If you want to be a contractor that qualifies for these incentive funds, you have to make a certain number of local hires. Um, so that's just good, because we're, we're giving work to the people that need it the most. Other entrepreneurial opp opportunities, we're in highly jealous of Portland, which has loads of mobile food trucks, but we're starting that as well. It's great for street life, but it's also a low-cost entrepreneurial entry. And oftentimes, your immigrant and refugee populations are your most entrepreneurial, so you want to give them ways to enter the, the marketplace. We've also had training programs for small markets to provide fresh foods which, by the way, also gets to the health issues we were talking about. Next big thing I would talk about is you have to build the right infrastructure for the future. I mentioned one already, which is walkable mixed-use communities. When we think of infrastructure, we tend to think big, massive projects with lots of concrete and iron. But, you know, those little granular things, affordable housing, sidewalks, um, local streets, all of those things actually create more jobs per dollar, better for health, better for the environment, too. So we have to get really more local and granular with our infrastructure spending as well. And think of it as a big project, including affordable housing. Housing is infrastructure, too. Transit is the next thing. Uh, Streetcars are coming back. It's an old-fashioned idea that's coming back. We have two small lines. We're working to connect them and expand them to go along with our regional light rail system that's expanding. And this is, by the way, good for this widening the circle of prosperity, shared prosperity idea. Transit means people have more money in their pockets instead of spending on, on automobiles. And of course, the environmental benefits are significant too. Broadband. This is the other way we connect. We want to connect in person in our neighborhoods, but we also want to connect using better uh, internet infrastructure. Our cities, like many other cities, uh, the incumbent telephone company and cable company aren't necessarily upgrading their infrastructure to get the bandwidth that our companies need. We're now doing something called GigU, where we're partnering with other universities around the nation to look at using our fiber optic cable. The city of Seattle owns tons of fiber optic cable. Much of it's dark. We don't need it. So can we make our dark fiber available to private companies in partnership with the university to wire a whole neighborhood and see what happens if people have that much bandwidth? Just like what happened when you got a phone that had everything on it. All sorts of things happened that you had no idea would happen. Other ideas, smart grid is important. We still go out and look at people's meters. We carry electricity, but we don't carry information on our grid. That's the other infrastructure we have to do. Green infrastructure, instead of gray infrastructure, cleaning water at the end of the pipe with some type of treatment facility, you do it at the top of the pipe. You infiltrate it naturally. 
more expensive, more granular, more green, creates more jobs, um, and ultimately you get uh, things much cleaner. Big capital investment, but the right way to go. High energy efficiency buildings are another type of infrastructure investment we're making. I'll talk about just one. This is the living building in the Bullet Foundation's building. Its energy will be entirely collected from the sun. Its water will be water that falls on the site. It's an extremely high green building standard. First one in the world being built in Seattle. Unfortunately, to build it, you have to break every rule to do it. It turns out it's pretty much illegal to build a building that performs this well. <laughs> so we have to change all of our regulations to make it happen. A lot of this is talking about finding waste, eliminating waste, and putting that captured value back into the community. All right, that's a big idea. And we do that with our waste too. In Seattle now, we have the recycling bin, the garbage bin, and the food waste bin. Actually, the yard waste bin, but now you toss your food waste in it. The food waste and yard waste goes to a regional composting facility, and then it comes back to the city in the form of dirt. This is a rooftop parking garage, and we are turning it into a pea patch. It's called the Up Garden, and it's uh, full of cedar grove compost, which came from all of our yard waste and food waste. So there's more we can do to eliminate waste from the system, um, you know, eliminating things like styrofoam, plastic. But the next big idea on this is how do you get manufacturers to design things from the beginning so they'll have to take it back and reuse the materials? So it's stopping the waste from getting into the stream in the first place um, rather than trying to divert it to another productive use. Um, because we're, we're at over 50% recycling now. Now we have to try to figure out how to divert, uh, how to reduce the waste in the first place. Now, if I can leave with one big idea that covers all of this, it's, I feel like we have two choices. And by the way, all of these ideas I've stolen from somebody else. This is what mayors do. They're great ideas that come from our community, come from other mayors, come from other speakers. We kind of have a choice about how we compete in the face of all of these challenges. One way is the low road which is everybody looks out for themselves. You push costs onto workers, you push environmental costs onto the community, and onto future generations, right? And the problem for Seattle, and I think it's a problem for America too, is we're not gonna do very well competing on the low road. It's just not really in us. So we're gonna have to figure out how to compete on the high road. And the high road is innovation, you gotta have good ideas, you gotta widen the circle of prosperity, so more people can share in the value generated by those ideas. We're gonna to have to become more efficient and sustainable environmentally. And other places will look at us and say, oh, that's how you can succeed while maintaining quality of life in the environment. So, we'll, so it will become contagious. And I just wanna say, I am really lucky to be mayor of a city in which the public in that city just embraces these ideas. We have huge challenges, we work really hard to meet them. Um, but it's, a, it's just a fabulous uh, thing, and it's a fabulous place to be mayor of. So thank you all.